right, we're back in a moment. Don't go away. As a build-up to the next general elections, the ruling All Progressives Congress across the country is organizing state congresses to elect new executives. In Cross River State, Mr. Alphonsus Eber emerges as the state party chairman through a consensus voice vote by party delegates at the UJ Swene Stadium in Calabar, the state capital. <laughs> Ben Ayade expresses satisfaction over the peaceful conduct of the Congress. He believes that this will ensure that Cross River fully becomes an APC state. Today we have a party, a party that is not just prepared to continue to sustain power in Cross River State, but actually join hands with our other states to ensure that Nigeria remains an APC country. <laughs> The Delta State delegates from across all the local government areas via a voice vote elected Omeni Sobotier as the chairman of the state chapter of the APC. The Deputy Senate President, Senator Ovio Mwagege, who was part of the exercise, calls for unity among members. We're looking forward to reconciliation. Our doors are open uh, uh, until we're able to achieve that unity. We want to continue to stress on those things that bring us together as opposed to those things that divide us. Oshobodi Oshun State Capitol witnesses parallel congresses as a group loyal to the state governor, Boyega Yatola, gather at the Oshobo City Stadium, where the incumbent party chairman, Prince Boyega Famodun, emerges victorious via voice vote. What all of us are praying for at the National Convention, like God has given us today, God will give, give us the convention. Amen. Governor Yatola challenges the new party executive to ensure a reconciliatory process that will guarantee unity. Every delegate must cast these are votes, I'm going to do it, these are wish. There must be no rancor, it's a party affair. It's an opportunity to select those that will run the affairs of the uh, party for the next one year. Meanwhile, the group loyal to the former governor of the state and minister of interior, Ralph Arekbeshala, gather at the Oshobo Bogon Road with Abdul Razak Salisile emerging as the factional chairman of the APC in the state. Two of our delegates were injured. We were very lucky because we had uh, concluded our programs and uh, every necessary step had been taken, necessary things concluded. For ourselves, the future of the place. The Baronu State Chapter of the Old Progressives Congress, through a consensus, adopts its own executive led by Ali Dalori to continue leading the party for another term of four years. We can see here for ourselves the future of the place. The Congress, which held at the Ramad Square, may degree, has in attendance the state governor of Abagana Zulum, his predecessor, Kashim Shatima, amongst other party stakeholders. I will assure you, we will not claim you and your members. And we will not claim all the members of the APC promoted in general. The APC Congress in Kano State held at the Sani Abacha Indoor Stadium where Governor Omaru Ganduje and over 3,000 delegates from the 44 local government areas were in attendance. Senator Kabiri Ibrahim Bea. The state party chairman, Abdullahi Abbas, was returned as chairman via a consensus. The governor, who describes the process as peaceful, says stakeholders should disregard any other Congress in the state. Any other location where you have pockets of disgruntled elements performing a similar function is regarded as illegal. Meanwhile, the parallel faction of the APC in Kano, led by Senator Ibrahim Shekarao and Tijani Jobe, conducted another state congress at Janguza in Tofa local government area, where Amadou Zago emerged parallel chairman. I thank all of you, and I assure you that being a chairman in Kano State APC, I will not, tell you, I will not let the party fail down. After these state congresses, the attention of the party now shifts to the national convention. Many would be watching, however, how the party is able to resolve the emergence of parallel congresses in several states.
Uh, welcome back. So we'll be talking about the APC Congress, even though we wanted to talk about the PDP Congress separately as well, but uh, we didn't see our invited guests. Uh, for that, we do have Mazu Magaji, who is a former member of the APC Presidential Campaign Council. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, good both morning. Good morning, yeah, Chamberlain. Nice having had me. Yeah, thank you. Both political parties seem to have this challenge facing themselves. But your party uh, even widely reported today that even high-ranking members have gone to court, which is something that the party would have thought, wait a minute, we thought we had a rule and an, and an understanding that you're not supposed to take us to court on some of these matters. But even in Kano, for instance, look at that. Two groups, they claim to the same primaries. What in the world is going on? Well, uh, it, it's, it's a season of uh, uh, dynamism and dynamics in, and changes in the political parties. It's a season uh, that basically throw out uh, the space for people to position themselves uh, for the eventual contest that is coming. However, you, you recall that, uh, Chamberlain, we've discussed this here, that uh, consensus or whatever you call it, have a principles of equity. And whatever you do, when the party said that uh, it prefers consensus, there was a landmine there, and we highlighted those landmines. And we did say that that consensus gives the opportunity of people in power to basically select individual they prefer to see as the leader and basically declare that person through a process that may seem to like a democracy. And this is what we are harvesting today. Unfortunately, in our party, we have mentioned that the state congresses will determine the fate of this party. And today, we have to seriously face the repercussion of some of this power that we've given to the state chief executives or principals that are in Abuja that have favored candidates that are not willing to subject these candidates to the popular decision of the people. This is a party that was formed on a progressive platform. This was the party that actually declared that uh, the direct primaries is the most likely means through which people will actually vote candidates in an internal democratic system. Now, we have moved from direct uh, primaries, which is basically the popular way people can express their opinion about individuals, to uh, a, a consensus, basically even jumping the delegate system. The delegate system is the in-between between direct uh, uh, primaries and the consensus system. You've mentioned uh, parallel primaries. It is all over Nigeria. Over two dozen states have multiple leaderships today. There are states with even three leaderships today. You've just heard uh, from the video clips you played that uh, the governor of Kano State is calling two senators and many House of Rep members who disagreed with his choice as disgruntled and their exercise is illegal. Now, this is not reconciliatory. This is not how consensus can be built. Uh, Kano have, have done primaries, and there are two very distinct primaries, and uh, two, two chairmen emerge. However, one of the chairmen who is already a sitting chairman had no consensus. Nobody pulled out for him. I had uh, uh, the Arnold Anzago is saying that he is the elected chairman. I sincerely believe he is a legitimate. I know two candidates that was drew for him, and uh, basically agreed on the consensus process. And irrespective of that, he was subjected to the process of election with delegates that voted for him. So, and there are a lot of these in, in many states. APC now have three challenges to face. One, there are states that have their primaries postponed because of the likelihood of violence. So there is an eruption already even before the primaries. And two, there are states with multiple leadership that have emerged just like you mentioned, I'm mentioning, and there are multiple challenges around the reconciliation because these functions represent the pillars upon which the party basically rests in those states. Then, of course, the last one is the fact that there are states who have managed to, because of the technique or the respect of the leader, managed to bring that consensus in the room. It may not be entirely democratic, but here uh, the leaders have gotten their members to accept all of that. The other thing also is that we have to be very careful going forward because whatever we do now, there is a tendency that is imagined. And the tendency is the clear split of the party. If you uh, trace the history of our party, it was a measure. It was a measure between contending political uh, 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 functions, I mean, I mean parties, uh, the ACN, for example, the ANPP, 
uh, part of ABGA, uh, then CPC came in, and then new PDP joined. Whatever you do, we just had one president. Less than eight years, you must consolidate those functions and not dismantle them. Now, what I see going on now is the clear uh, choice of some elements within the uh, measure to basically decide to take the party and run away with it. And all the protests and all the, the, the dimensions we are witnessing is as a result of reactions from the other partners in this, in this measure to basically uh, 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 ensure that they protect their space. Now, the danger of this is that you might force uh, uh, yourself, because you are in government and you hold public office, uh, to take away this party space. However, you may not be able to get away with the membership base. Because the membership base is a contribution of the various political uh, uh, groups that came together and formed this party. And also, APC have just led. And this is the first time we've been leading, we've been in opposition. And many of our members are complaining that we have not been able to demonstrate the capacity to create shared consensus in management of our victory. Now, this is the first phase. The best we could do is to consolidate on this partnership by ensuring that there is equity, uh, inclusiveness, and fair participation of all the parties that participate in that merger with a view to creating a united front to face the opposition party that are now regrouping and realigning. If know, we do that, then we will learn from the mistake that we have made the first time, because there's no way you can get it right the first time, then we will basically iterate those mistakes into ensuring that we have a better governance. However, well, right now, what I'm seeing and what I'm witnessing and what I'm hearing is that we are basically creating more of these problems than solutions. So from, from what you've just highlighted, that uh, clearly the, the, the party is in opposition with itself. But you say that this is at the very base, the foundation of the political party where those groups that came to agree, some want to take the party and run away. But now, that is something that strikes at the heart of the political party. So do you, having highlighted uh, all of these challenges, is this something you think that at the end of the day, because politicians always say they're optimistic that these things will be addressed, do you see them being addressed to the extent that you're not going to be limping towards the uh, convention, as it were? This is a very critical question, uh, Shambhali, because it is the culture within the political party that determines whether the party have the capacity to patch up this kind of challenges. Now, I will tell you something. There is always a saying in our political meetings that we are better off as opposition party, and PDP is always better off in governance. However, we switched role. So we all are struggling right now. APC is struggling in governance, PDP is struggling in opposition. The problem is sharing space is key to creating inclusiveness in political democracy. And most of the things I see and the moves I see, it's about taking space and not sharing it. And if we don't develop the culture of sharing space and coordinating ourselves and respecting each other, then we will limp to election. And when we limp to election, we have two other challenges. APC as a party promised a lot of changes. And the reality on ground basically challenged our leadership in delivering the promises of those changes. Now that means that the ordinary people who worked and toiled to elect us into power have been expecting a lot from us. And the reality of economic challenges and dynamics of power have not been able to give us the leverage to deliver on those promises. That is a challenge in itself that our political base is actually now deciding whether we have delivered on our promises. The second thing is the political the personalities that basically came into this merger with their support base. Take, for example, uh, uh, President Muhammad Bahari came with two, uh, 12 million votes over time, and His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu, two principal party in the merger came with a very strong strategic and political organization with the resources and committed those resources and experience to the success of the merger. Now, today, these two functions, I am sorry to say, are at loggerhead. You hear parallel primaries 
by supporters of Bola Ahmed Tenobu. You hear people going to court by his supporters in the same APC. If we are losing the cohesion of these two principles and the unity of purpose that we have created in the merger, then definitely that's a second layer challenge. The third one is that we are inviting people that the masses have rejected in 2015 election, celebrating them as new entrants to our party. I am afraid to say this may backfire on us because the concept of change by the ordinary Nigerians means that there are certain characters that they view as not friendly to their well-being and to the management of their resources, and they rejected them. Now, we are going back to our vomit and inviting these people, taking them to villa, or even visiting them in their homes and pleading with them to come back and join the space that people created for change. I think this will backfire on our party because the elites in our party are now being displaced by the elites from opposition and the ordinary people are being ignored because of economic challenges that we are unable to turn around for productive and, uh, and, uh, and prosperity of our ordinary people. The three combinations of um, living behind our legs, which is the ordinary people, and uh, uh, chopping up our head, which is the major partners, and injecting foreign organs into our body, which is the opposition people we are inviting, will not spell well for us unless we do a serious soul searching and review. Uh, uh, concerning that third one that you just mentioned, I I'm just wondering, what should the APC have done when other people say they want to join the party? Send them back? Is it against the law for people to defect no, into no. another party? No, no. Actually, party is about addition, not subtraction. It is the way you receive them, is the prominence you attach to them, is the propagation of that the campaign that says you do not actually have confidence in your own principles, ideology, and platform. When people from opposition parties who have done things that people rejected in an election are coming back to you, you tell them to go back to their constituency. You tell them to go and atone for their sin in their local environment. You don't take them to our presidential villa, for example. You don't take a whole gamut of governors and visit opposition and pleading with them. I've joked and I said, it's only in Nigeria that a ruling party after eight years have not been able to produce a worthy successor, have to go to an opposition party and plead with them to borrow them candidates. This is scandalous for us. Believe me, this is absolutely serious matter in a political democracy. If, for example, we are unable to hold the ground of this party, then let us also slide back to opposition and learn from our mistakes. But we cannot just basically betray the trust of the ordinary people that voted for change and then go back and invite these same people that caused this change to take place. Well, um, you, you, you've said quite a number of things that are very, very interesting, one of which is that people, politicians, should go back to their wards. And I'd like, us to, to, I'd like you to take us to the ward level. What kind of politics, in your opinion, happens at the ward level? As we all say, everyone the president, the national leader of your party that you mentioned, everyone has only one vote at the ward level. But then when you look at some of the issues that have arisen from the Congresses that has held, most of it is always from the ward level. But many times we look at, you know, what's happening at the top. What, can, what do you think, do you think the problems we're talking about here could be something that's arisen from the ward level or is just something that's happened from the top and cascades down? No, no, it's not ward level. The ward level is on paper. It's an institutional structure of the party on paper. I will tell you something. Uh, I just came in and uh, my mentor, uh, Professor, Professor Jagawa was discussing the fault lines, the challenges of our democracy. And I listened. The issue here is simple that the political parties are formed and unfortunately on a democratic system with a very clear constitution. But when people take position of authority, either in the party or in the government, we default back to our traditional emirate system or kingship. And I will explain what I mean. That individuals that win election don't seem to believe that they will be subjected 
to the judgment of the people in the next election. What they do is basically organize a process of dictating the outcome of things right from the world level. And because there is economic challenges, which Professor Jega has highlighted, there is the tendency of people to just wait for instruction. There is a tendency of people to just belong to this ruling power. There is a tendency of people to hope that resources will reach them if they behave well. So when leaders, especially at state level, like governors, for example, or at national level, like the leaders of the party, give instructions, you have no right to challenge those instructions. It's not democracy. Nobody can say no to that. If you do, believe me, in a matter of 48 hours, you are out. You'll be disgraced, you'll be denied, and in fact, you'll be economically disturbed. So the world level is not at all institutionally strong, neither is the local government. So just like we're suffering from autonomy of local government in governance, there's even worse lack of autonomy of local government and world in our political structure. Our democracy is collapsing before our own very eyes. We are replacing it with an emirate system where you meet in the nose particularly, you see political leaders sitting on a chair and everyone is sitting on the floor gallivanting around these leaders as if they are worshiping them. This is not democracy. Democracy was not created to enslave people. It is created to empower people and liberate them and give them the freedom and the respect that they deserve as citizens. Now, you have talked about this word structure. Honestly speaking, I go to my word and I ask the chairman, what is your plan? And he said, I'm waiting for instruction from the local government. And the local government chairman, I said, what do you do? Oh, he said, well, the governor is going to call us and tell us what to do. I am telling you, the internal democracy of our party is not working as it should. There are fault lines, like Professor Ch uh, Jagar said, and the challenges are enormous. However, there is a ray of hope. Believe me, I have always said this, that at some point, you cannot hold this together. Unless we recognize that democracy is for the people, and is by the people, and it's meant to serve the people, then definitely, we will definitely lose the focus of how the democracy was built and how people can come into power. And if we do that, then we will lose the authority that is bested on people when they are constitutionally elected into party or into office. Is this a challenge that bedevils your political party or is such that affects other political parties because these people come from those, come from different parts of the country, for instance, and then they belong to the political party secondarily, having come from a particular area. So is this a challenge that you think this is why the country seems to be struggling with achieving certain things, so achieving at least the barest minimum of our potential? I, I think it's a combination of two things. In, in my political party, there is an issue of inexperience in terms of how to manage the success that comes from political election. And there is the issue of lack of um, uh, basically coalescing into an organization that we can call political party. I will tell you, we're still an association. There are clusters of interest group all over our party that are meeting in all different forests and mapping out the same exact outcome that the party shall sit down and map out. Now, that is the tendencies that is creating all these fra fra uh, uh, frictions and cracks. In the other parties, I think it is culture. That's the second thing. The culture of Nigeria and Africa that came from the kingship and emirate system around power is basically coming back deeply into our democracy. So, and the culture of followers that tend to hero worship leaders and without realizing the power that democracy vested in the people, it's also coming back. And these two are gelling together and creating a powerful block of minority out of 200 million people that hold on to power and promise heaven and earth to people around them and use all sort of means to fend away any sort of challenge and opposition, including violence, including money, including threats. This is a very dangerous trend in our democracy. And I think the elites of this country, both parties, need to yeah. come together and have an elite consensus about okay, so, the survival of our democracy yeah, before the 2023 say, election. Yeah, when you say 
for your political party is inexperienced. Well, yes, they're coming together, then they're in the ruling party, but the components of that party, can they equally be said to be inexperienced? For instance, the president is not inexperienced politically. The vice president, uh, also not inexperienced politically. The uh, president of the Senate, the speaker of the House of Representatives, the party leader, former governor of Lagos State, different persons in different positions. These are people who have pedigree, I say, where they've been to certain areas, they've got experience in certain fields. And so what part of that can that also be said to be inexperienced? So the inexperience is in the ability to gel into a united, cohesive, inclusive political organization with a common goal and common vision. The president stands still as President Muhammadu Buhari and basically individuals see him as individual, believe me. And the vice president, experienced as he is, I wonder how much action and space he commands in today's government and largely due to political issues. The Senate president and the speaker are very experienced politicians and I wonder how many times the party call for a meeting of these principal officers in government and say, where is the way forward? All the people you've mentioned, except the leader, are in government and they are busy trying to deliver the promise of governance, which is the first time for our party, which also brings inexperience. The most experienced person, however, is the leader of the party, Ahmed Bola Chinubu. And unfortunately, the internal dynamics of the party and the lack of cohesion of the various interest group has not allowed that experience to benefit the party. It did work well for us in 2015 when we were listening and we were tapping and we were leveraging on the experience. But today, we've taken a completely different dimension and different uh, uh, direction that other people who just came in four years, eight years or less than that, believe that the combination of office and power can give them political experience. In my honest opinion, the two are different. You can come into power and exercise excellently well uh, the power on behalf of the people and still not be able to control your political space and struggle with it. And that is exactly why we are seeing all these functions in the state. The ability of the state chief executive to exercise the dual combination of political power and political office is limited. Which, is, which, which, is which leads to this question. Even the success. Uh, just one second, if you don't mind me asking. Uh, the, the last statement that you just made now leads to this question that I want to ask. Uh, hitherto, in our previous political experiences, the First Republic, Second Republic, and Third Republic, Second and Third Republic, uh, particularly because uh, I was old enough to know, that the national party structures, the party structures were much stronger than the political office holders at the time. I would remember the, 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 chair, the national chairman of the ruling party in the Second Republic and the national chairman of the ruling parties in the Third Republic, the SDP and the NRC. But it would seem like that has, it's a little, it's a lot different now. What's your take? Do you think, are you suggesting in any way that we should go back to that system? Actually, we are, we are there. It's only the actors that have not allowed the institution of democracy, that is the political party, to function. And I think this started when we had uh, a military leader that we invited and uh, became a, a political leader. He was not able to actually tolerate the independence of political party. And it was clear from the history of Obasanjo's regime how he basically meddled into the party affair. That culture has not left us, even when uh, we, we still transited. If you look at when Shagari was there, the, the national party leader is as very well known as the president, very powerful. And we transited to this mix of military uh, political regime during IBB. And IBB tends to play a political military leader, and he respects the boundaries of democracy and institutionalizes it. But somehow the military culture never left him, and you could see the end result of his regime. And now we are in the democracy. We still have a president who had a military background. But uh, somehow this president 
give space for people to act. The problem is the space is taken by many people. And the leadership required to coordinate that can only be available from a political leader like Bola Ahmed Tunubu. While the president is leading the country, I believe sincerely Bola Ahmed Tunubu could have led us into a very cohesive, coherent transition that will create a common vision for our party and organize ourselves for victory. Right now, we're going to be struggling a lot. And there is need, like you rightly pointed out, for political parties to be political parties the motherboard of all contestants and candidates, and when you win election, there is a missing link here. The party do not represent anything, do not have any policy, do not have any manifesto that we will look at and say, oh, Republicans party or Democrats, right. this is what we expect, social welfare or uh, businesses will grow. Everything goes in our major parties today. And with this, there will be no clear deepening of democracy. All right, then, uh, Masu Magaji, former member, APC Presidential Campaign Council. Thank you very much indeed for your perspectives this morning. Thanks for having me.